Today our message will be delivered to us by Elder Jordan, review on the life of Enoch. But in order for us to be prepared for that message, but Arnold choose to present to us life is hard. Enoch's was hard. And he, as he sings, may the Spirit of God move through his voice, speak to our hearts, and prepare us for the message that we shall receive today. Well done. You turn the key, close the door behind you, drop your bags on the floor. You reach for the light, but there's darkness deep inside, and you can't take it anymore. Sometimes living takes the life out of you. Sometimes living is all you can do. Life is hard. The world is cold. You're very young and then we're old. But every falling tear is always understood. Life is hard. But God is so good. Has he been good to you? You start to cry. Because you've been strong for so long. But that's not how you feel. You try to pray, but there's nothing left to say. So you just quietly kneel. And in the silence, of all that you face, God will give you His mercy and grace. Jesus never said it was an easy road to travel. He only said that you will never be alone. So when your last tread of hope began to come unraveled don't give up he'll walk beside you on this journey home and he knows life is hard sometimes the church is cold we're very young and then we're getting old Every falling tear is always understood. Life is hard. Oh, life is hard. But God, so good. He's good to me. God is good. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, <clears throat> Hope Fellowship started a book reading, book study program in the afternoons on the book preparation for the final crisis. Um, my wife and I, our family, looked at this book a long time ago. It was written by an author by the name of Fernando Chai. Today, um, 
the message was based on that book, but the audience and the time period, I'm going to abridge this. Um, <clears throat> and I'm asking Dion in the back, just follow me by the slide numbers, because everything is going to be kind of um, cut uh, a little bit. So I'd like to pray at this time as we look through the portals of time back to um, what I would consider a very strange event that we only understand today, but just imagine living in a time period when it actually happened. Um, that is why it is called strange. Pray with me at this time. Father in heaven, we have the freedom to worship you on the Sabbath. The theme of my favorite book, The Great Controversy, uh, talks about events that were soon to come in which uh, that freedom will be taken away. But while we have it, may we appreciate it. And as we look at the life of this Bible character, may it inspire us and strengthen us to serve you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the text in Hebrews chapter 5, 11 and verse 5 that was read today, and there's just a series of texts, and again, this is going to be an abbreviated um, version of what I have here. <clears throat> uh, the writer in Hebrews says something very strange in regards to Enoch. He says that by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And not only that, he says that he was not found. And the reason being was because God had translated him for before his, meaning Enoch's translation, he had this testimony or this witness that he pleased, that he pleased God. Um, navigating uh, sort of through all of this, I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 5. It's the best way I can go with this. And in Genesis chapter 5, we are given the genealogy of Adam. I don't have a lot of room to move around up here. Um, thank you. I forgot this thing has wheels. <laughs> we are given a genealogy of the life uh, of the genealogy of Adam. The similar way that if you go and you look at your, your what do they call those ancestry trees or whatever it is that you see that you know you I, I was able to I was able to go all the way back to um, some of my family members in, in America in the 1940s, but. As we look at this, and we're given a particular view of this, we are brought to the fact that there are two categories of righteous people. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 5, and I'm going to be highlighting certain points out of Genesis 5 to start this off in a brief detail. And I want you to notice some of these verses that I kind of put together in pairs. Genesis 5, and I want to look at starting with Genesis 5, verses 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 5, sorry, verses, verses 4 and 5. And here is what the Bible says. And the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years, and then afterwards, the Bible says he died. And in Genesis chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Seth had Enos. And then in verse 8, after 900 years, he did what? Talk to me. He died. And then in verse 10, again, we have Enos. He begot Cainan. And then after time period, Enos died. And then if we go down to Genesis chapter 
5 and verse 14, all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he again died. And then we have Mahalel, and after 890 years and five years, he died. And then we go all the way down, if we keep going down, we can come to verse 31, and all the days of Lamech were 700 years, and the Bible says he died. We understand that the book of Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. But then, all of a sudden, I remember the first time I read this thing, I, I couldn't uh, um, get a grip on this. There was something strange in Genesis chapter 5. And you have to go down to verse 20. And the Bible tells us in all the days of Jared, were 962 years and he died, but then the Bible says something else. It says, and Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah. And then something else happened with Enoch. The Bible tells us that Enoch now lived another 300 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the years of Enoch versus all the other Bible characters was under 500 years. And the Bible in the King James Version says this in verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says very briefly, and I have no time to get into the Hebrew connotations behind this. And the Bible says he was not. Very simple. And the reason being was that God took Enoch. The Hebrew writer that we had just read, to get a better understanding, I have to go back to verse 5, and then I'm going to quickly list some points. Because in order to understand the remnant of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, you have to go back to the antediluvian time period in order to understand this group of people that will exist and live in this time period of the last days. You have to see their characteristics in the antediluvian time period through Enoch. The term antediluvian is very simple. It anti means before in the Latin, and diluvian pretty much means deluge, or the destruction before the flood. So that before the flood had occurred, there was a problem in the world. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6 so that we could see what this particular problem was. And in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible tells us something that was happening. And the Bible says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, now watch the text, was only evil. How long? Continually. Just picture a scientific factory that on every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing nothing but generating evil. This is what was happening pervasively in the world. And in verse uh, number 6, the Bible tells us, And it repented the Lord that he made man on earth. And the Bible uses the term that it grieved his heart. But scripture tells us something, that there was a man named Enoch. And for that time period of the 300 years, the Bible tells us that he walked with God. So there are four Bible references, and you can write these down, that deals with Enoch. Enoch, not a lot appears in scripture concerning Enoch. But when you link these texts together to other texts in the Bible, which, you know, we're not going to too much do, you are able to give a full picture of the life of Enoch. So we have the first one, Genesis chapter 5, verses 18 through 
verse 24, in which Enoch walked with God. We have the next text, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, is that he pleased God and he had faith in God. In Luke chapter 3, verse 37, the Gentile doctor mentions and says that his name is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. And in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, the Bible tells us that he had the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. So in those four texts, you find descriptions of Enoch. But in three of them, you find something even deeper. So let's just simply talk about uh, uh, the three distinct characteristics that the people of God living in the end times must have. Number one, Enoch walked with God. What does it actually mean biblically to walk with God? One of the things we understand in the Hebrew word walk, it comes from the Hebrew word halak, which simply means conduct one's way of life for good or evil. So walking with God is simply how you conduct your life. You either going to conduct your life in the right way or you're going to conduct your life in the wrong way. An indication of this or an illustration of this is given in Psalm chapter 1 in which it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth, standeth in the way of the sinners, thank you, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So walking with God is, 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 similar, is, is uh, similar to um, obeying God. Or one of the things that the phrases of walking with God is synonymous with keeping God's commandments. So we start to expand a little bit on this. We find something interesting here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. And the Bible says this. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. In Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4, the Bible again tells us, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him or respect him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave or hold fast unto him. So we see that walking with God is again synonymous with keeping his commandments which was one of the traits that Enoch had. The second trait that Enoch had was that he had faith in God or that he pleased God. Interestingly enough, we find inside of scripture something concerned concerning the word pleased. And one of the things that I would encourage all of us in the congregation, both young and old, is this. You need to learn how to become a detective of the scriptures. You know, what I find today in our church today, when I came in this church many, many years ago, at the age of 19, I was invested as a master guide. I don't know how many people here know about Pathfinders. And back then in the master guide, two areas I got involved with, uh, two studies I got involved with, which I le really loved, was Bible doctrines and church history. I taught church history for many years. And one of the things I loved about Bible doctrines, as I was telling the folk, the younger, uh, I think one time, was um, I learned the 2300 days prophecy. And... One Saturday night, instead of eating burgers and fries at McDonald's, I had a group in the back of the McDonald's restaurant, and I was drawing out the entire 2300-day prophecy chart and talking to them. So if you want to understand scripture, you have to get a dictionary and your Bible, and you have to become a detective. And you have to understand something. The Bible cannot be a boring book if you want to make it to heaven. The book Great Controversy page 534 tells us this, that none but those who adhere to the principles of the Bible would make it through the last great conflicts. So if scripture is not something young and old that you like, you're going to have a hell of a hard time. 
and I underscore the word hell. So we find something here about the word please, which simply means to be favorably accepted. And we find something about Enoch concerning this in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. And we read, and, and, and Elder God had read this for us. The Bible says that by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Why was Enoch translated? Simply put. Because in Enoch's walk with life, he pleased God. If you could please for me in the back, put this um, slide on the screen for me. And I think it is slide um, number six and seven. And it says this, and I'm sure you all can see it. Enoch's walk with God was not in a trance or vision, but in how many duties? All duties of his daily life. He did not become a hermit, shutting himself in from the enti entirely from the world, for he had a work to do for, the wor for God in the world. In the family and in his intercourse with men as a husband and a father, a friend, a citizen, he was, the, he was the steadfast, unwavering servant of God. So we have the fact here that Enoch was faithful in all his beings. So all the aspects of his life, in all the relationships that he had, he was a personal witness to all whom he came in contact with. The next and the last area that we find concerning the life of Enoch was that Enoch had faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 opens up with the, the very, very famous text that says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it finishes up by saying, For by it the elders obtained a good, extremely good report. I want you to do me a favor if you could put on the screen for me slide number 11 as we come down to another aspect of the life of Enoch. We find in the book, the little book Jude chapter, Jude, I'm sorry, in verses 14 and 15, and it says this, and Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And you see the consistent theme of the word ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. So now the question is, was it only Noah that preached the message of what was going to happen to the world? The answer to that is no, because we see it here in Jude 14 and 15. On, on, slide, um, on slide 11, the next slide, Dion, if you could put that on the screen. So we find here in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 85, that through holy angels... God revealed to Enoch his purpose to do what? Destroy the world by what? By a flood. The, going further. And he also opened more fully to him the plan of redemption. By the spirit of prophecy, he carried him down through the generations that should live, how? After the flood. So the message of Enoch not only applies to those in the antediluvian world, but it applies to those in the post-antediluvian world as well. He carried them down through the generations that should live after the flood, and he showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. The question is simply this, as we asked, as I asked before. Is there going to be a generation that is similar to Enoch 
that would do the things as Enoch did. Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Committed to the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy. See, is there such a group? And the answer to that is yes. Dion, slide number 13, and follow me all the way to number 20. We find something interesting. If you don't know about Seventh-day Adventists, here is a clear-cut definition that I read many, many years ago when I bought these books uh, at, at many years ago. Testimonies, Volume 9. Go to the next um, slide, please. And it says this, and follow me, congregation, please. She says, in a special sense, who? Who? Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and what? Light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. Next slide, please. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. What is that work? The proclamation of what? The first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Here's what she says further. There is no other work of so great importance. They are not allowed nothing else to absorb their attention. Next slide, please. The solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given to who? Us to proclaim to the world. What was Enoch doing in the middle of all the conflict and the evilness going on? He was proclaiming the gospel to the then known world. What is our job during the conflict and all the different things that are going on? We are to proclaim the gospel to the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned. And God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. Next slide, please. Christ says of his people, you are the light of the world. It is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been so clearly open to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. This places on us a what? A what? Heavy responsibility. End quote. There's more, but that's okay. So the question is, is there a work for the youth in this matter? We find something very interesting in the book Education. Uh, slide 21, please. Long time ago, as part of the, um, my master guide training, which is long time ago, we had to read this book, Education. Page 20, uh, slide 21, Dion. And here is what is said. Thank you. On the book Education, page 271, this is what the pen of inspiration records for our youth. Now, throughout the church history, there's something that we understand is that a lot of our work was started by whom? Young people, our A Adventist Youth Society was started in 1874 in a place called Hazeltown, Michigan. Two individuals, Harry Ferner, 14, Luther Warren, 17. Those individuals praying inside of a cornfield in the winter under a tree had a vision that God wanted to use youth to finish the work. And here's what she says. With such an army of workers as our what? Youth. How are they going to be able to do the work? They have to be rightly trained. Might furnish. How soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the what? End come. The end of suffering and sorrow and sin. The next slide on page 25, a uh, slide on uh, slide 25 as we wrap this up. Again, I said I was keeping this short. I skipped through a lot of things, but that's fine. 
Slide 25 tells us something as an appeal in Acts of the Apostle, page 60. One of the things that we were looking at within the book um, Preparation for the Final Crisis is what is needed spiritually to prepare ourselves to go through what is to come. Now, we find here the process that we live daily with Christ, simply sanctification. And she says this, sanctification is not the work of a what? A moment, a what? An hour, a what? A day, but what? But a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly doing what? Dying to sin and doing what? Constantly living for Christ. Simply put, that's what it is. Similar. That's okay. Similar to Enoch before the flood. Um, God needs a people prepared to finish the work. There's something I'm going to go back on, and I need to do this. One of the things that the Bible talks about inside of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, it mentions commandment keeping. And one of the things that seems to be happening in this world today is that religious freedom seems to constantly be taken away. One of the things that we learn concerning the remnant is that because they are commandment-keeping people, they will be able to enjoy and live with Jesus because they are obedient to his law. However, before the reward is given, the remnant will go through a traumatic time period in which persecution will take place. Um, God's law will be disregarded in respect of the fourth commandment regarding the worship of God on God's holy day. Go back and understand the United States Constitution if you don't. We find here the United States of America will be the country that enacts a Sunday law commanding all to worship on the day of the sun. Now let's take a further look at this. What we have in the First Amendment, and I'm not sure how many of you actually read through the amendments and understand this, but the First Amendment of the Constitution tells us that Congress can make no law regarding an establishment of religion or the prohibition of freedom, free exercise thereof. In other words, you and I, under the Constitution, have the right to freely worship God the way we see fit. But uh, that free right will be taken away. Hence, here is what I encourage you to do. Number one, I encourage you that every Sabbath that you come to a Seventh-day Adventist church, that you are thankful that you have the freedom to worship. Remember, Enoch lived a sanctified life in the middle of a crime-infected messed up world during that time. And what God had to do was he had to fix that world through a flood. Now, once again, we are living in a world that is messed up in sin. Even our leaders and rulers don't know what to do about it. And it's going to require and call for a people to stand up, put their trust in Christ, not only make Christ their foothold, but make Christ their rock and foundation. God bless you.